But our subject is keeping the kids. We've looked at several things, and we want to look tonight at one more way that we keep the kids, and that is that the young people must be discipled. We looked at discipline, but now discipleship, discipled. Look with me at Matthew 28, verse 19, at the Lord's command. Matthew 28, verse 19, the Great Commission, verses 18 and 19. Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19, Jesus said, Go ye therefore, I'm sorry, verses 19 to 20, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And so, not just winning people to Christ, not just baptizing them, but teaching them to observe. That is talking about obedience, discipleship, to be disciples of the Lord. That's our objective. And churches, and I thank the Lord that I have the privilege of preaching in churches that are keeping the kids, that are winning that battle for the most part. And churches that are keeping the kids are churches that are making disciples of the kids. Young people who turn out right are those who are serving the Lord. They're not just sitting there. If you're just sitting there, if the kids are just sitting there, eh, they're not going to stay. It's the kids that are serving the Lord that are going to be around here in 20 years. Many people that wrote to me on this subject, hundreds of people wrote to me on this subject, many of them fervently talked about the importance of this. One said, the bar is set too low for many young people. They're treated as if they're expected to be silly teens. As long as they don't do a few bad things, as long as they don't, and they do a few good things, they're treated as if they're godly. So many of the young people in churches that I've been familiar with are good, but they're not godly. Good kids will eventually get devoured by the world. But truly spiritual ones will develop into mature Christians. Too many are treated according to the worldly concept of teenagerhood. I think that a failure by teens to understand that they should be godly young men and young ladies is hurting many. Another wrote and said, Churches need to quit entertaining the youth. They play games, take trips, and watch movies. This is fine in its proper place, but the main thing ought to be the gospel. And then to grow them, when youth grow up, they get used to being entertained. And when they become adults, all that stops. And the entertainment that was keeping them, when it's gone, they leave as well. Another wrote and said youth groups need to organize more service-oriented activities rather than primarily entertainment activities. Another wrote, I feel a major reason why young adults drop out of churches is because they were won by the fun that they could have. There's no emphasis on serving the Lord and serving others around them. The emphasis is on them and what people can do to serve them This begins at a very early age with small children. Everything's supposed to be fun. Then as they get older, you have to make everything fun to keep their attention. Everything must be fun. Volleyball games, parties, everything. That is not what the church was ever about down through the ages. Church was a place to learn about God, to serve, to exhort one another, uh, to, uh, uh, to exhort one another. Even adults go to church these days for what they can get, not what they can give. If children were taught to go to church because it's the right thing to do, it is commanded, and yes, there's times uh, it's fun, but they wouldn't be so disheartened when things change. Now they're adult age, and it's very hard to make everything fun for them. All of a sudden, attending church is sitting in the pew, listening to the preacher, and the child that was brought up on fun says, hey, I don't need this. Another wrote and said, we must stop trying to entertain them when they're young and specialize on discipling them 
so that when they reach young adulthood, they'll be grounded in the Word and have their focus on Christ and know how to handle the storms of life. Oh, many, many others wrote to me fervently about that subject. Disciples, they must be grounded in the Word. That's one of the foundational things. We've talked about salvation this week. But after a young person is saved, the, the, founda- the fundamental thing is to ground him in the Word of God. You want to be a disciple of Christ? You've got to become grounded in the Word of God. There is no shortcut. You can't skip over that one. I knew that as a young Christian. I didn't know what God wanted me to do. I was a, a, a hitchhiker. I'd just gotten out of jail. Uh, I was a mess. I was a, uh, just a, a rebel before I got saved, a drug user, a drug sailor. I sold drugs for a while as a a part of my living. And I got saved and my life was changed. And I loved the Word of God, which is evidence. And and, and I knew, I didn't know what God wanted me to do, but I knew that to do anything for God and to know His will, I had to learn this book. Somehow this book had to get down and, and my thinking had to be, God's thinking had to become my thinking. And that comes through His Word. And so... That's foundational. We've got to just ground the young people in the Word of God. And there's not all the time in the world, a church that is just busy entertaining, 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 can't possibly have enough time to really seriously ground the young people in the Word of God. And there's a place to have a good time sometimes. I'm not opposed to that. But if that's the emphasis... There's no way we can do what is really important. Let's remind ourselves of how important it is to ground us in the Word of God. Psalms 1, 1 through 3. Psalms 1, 1 through 3. How important the Word of God is. Psalms 1, 1 through 3. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. His delight. What do you delight in tonight? That will tell us where your heart is and where you are headed. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And friends, I can tell you honestly, sincerely, from the bottom of my heart, that after 37 years of studying this book, it is more delightful today than it has ever been. I told you last night how I got all caught up in sports one time uh, uh, some years back when we lived in Washington State and became a baseball nut for a little while. And, uh, oh, but the Word of God is so much more wonderful. These days I'm studying prophecy, studying a lot of things. It's just just glorious, the Word of God. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in His law doth He meditate day and night. That's what He thinks about. You want, if we're going to make disciples of the young people, this has to be the characteristic of their life. And he shall be like a tree that is planted by the, uh, 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 the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. You want to prosper? There's the path of prosperity. Psalm 119, verse 9. Psalm 119, verse 9. Grounded in God's word. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? Good question there. By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Psalm 119 verse 105. Psalm 119 verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Acts 20, 32. Just a few reminders tonight of the power and the necess- of the Word of God and the necessity of, of filling our lives with it if we are going to be disciples of Christ in this dark and wicked world. Acts 20, 32. Acts 20, 32. And now, brethren, he's talking to the elders at Ephesus, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. So you've got to have a personal relationship with God. 
and to the word of His grace, which is able, the word has ability, power, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. It has power. Oh, a man talked to me last night after the service. Many people talked to me in this meeting and some good testimonies and very encouraging to me. And one man said how he used to just be a real sports fanatic. And, but then he got in the Word of God, really started studying the Bible. That'll change your thinking. And suddenly he realized how stupid that is, sports that is. And, and many other things. And you learn how to weigh things and, you, and your thinking becomes right and wise. It'll change you. Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is quick, living, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Power. 1 Peter 2, verse 2. 1 Peter 2, verses 1 and 2. Just a few reminders of the necessity if we're going to be disciples of Christ, of the necessity of building a strong foundation of Bible knowledge. 1 Peter 2, verse 1, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. Now, there is a long list of stuff to lay aside right there. That's a lifelong task. It's, it's, it's growing. Christian, uh, the, the uh, sanctification Practical sanctification is a matter of growing, walking, not leaping and flying, but walking, growing, laying those things aside. That's a long list. That's a far-reaching list there. But then it says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. That ye may grow thereby. The power of growth. Spiritual growth is in the Word of God. And there is no other way. You neglect the Bible, you are already backsliding. You're going backwards. We're either going forwards or backwards. And uh, as soon as we neglect, start neglecting the Word of God, we're going backwards spiritually. And as soon as we really get serious about the Word of God, we start moving ahead. The power is there, the power for spiritual growth and wisdom and all of the things that we need to be disciples of Christ. But the average fundamental Baptist church family is feeding young people a diet, a poor and insufficient diet of spiritual food from God's Word. I'm convinced of it. Babies need pablum. But man, if that's all you could have to live on the rest of your life, that would be terrible. And, 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 uh, but to remain on pablum perpetually is symptomatic of a serious problem and will not sustain mature spiritual life. Sunday schools and youth groups typically aim to meet the needs of the lowest common denominator of those present. And that's usually pretty low. And I'm not talking about visitors from outside. I'm talking about our own kids. Pretty low. And so the teaching is perpetually shallow and simplistic. Perpetually. Never gets beyond pablum. But you can't build disciples for Christ that can take a stand for Him in this wicked hour on pablum. You're going to have to have some steak. Oftentimes a cheeseburger maybe. No, steak. Oftentimes it doesn't get beyond the basic gospel. And a few little points of Christian living and a few externals of what we're supposed to do. One pastor wrote and said, we must preach the Bible more thoroughly. We need to trust our young people with the Word, with the Bible and teach them how to properly use it in their everyday lives. We teach fundamentals of math and grammar and spelling and history. Why not systematic study of the Bible geared toward young people? 
I came to this church finding the second generation barely holding on to the foundations their parents had put in place and a third generation that was nowhere to be found. They're gone. Why? I believe that the Bible was not given a priority and many false assurances of salvation were given at the altar for emotion's sake and not for Christ's sake. And that's another subject we've dealt with. Another respondent said, uh, we must get the young people grounded in the Word by teaching them how to study the Bible, how to use reference works like a concordance, treasury of Scripture knowledge, solid biblical commentaries. They need to be taught to meditate on the Word, how to apply the Word to their lives, how to develop a close relationship with God through thanksgiving and praise and prayer. And young people need to be shown how and why the Bible's true and reliable above all other sources. They do. Sunday schools and youth Bible studies need to be a lot more serious than they are. And I believe young people will respond to that. I believe they'll respond to it. And if they don't, there's no hope because there is no shortcut discipleship. Answers in Genesis found that Sunday school, this is what they found in a poll they took. Sunday school is actually more likely to be detrimental to the spiritual and moral health of our children. And I believe I understand that having grown up in a Southern Baptist Sunday school. I tell you, that's some boring stuff. The teacher would come in and read the quarterly to us. <clears throat> Boy, that's some powerful stuff. That'll bore you to tears. If you don't leave a church like that when you grow up, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> and I'm only half kidding. Yeah, good. I'm not even half kidding. We need church, but we need the right church. They found that students who regularly attend Sunday school are, quote, more likely to become anti-church through the years. Yeah, in the wrong kind of church, in the wrong kind of Sunday school, in the wrong kind of youth group. That's because, quote, Sunday school actually didn't do anything to help them develop a biblical worldview. It's what I experienced as a child in Sunday school, vacation Bible school. They made the Bible silly. Silly. Noah's Ark was a silly little thing that couldn't possibly float. And if it did float, it wouldn't float in a storm. Little toy ark. David slaying the giant, little boy. He wasn't a little boy. And it wasn't a silly cartoon thing. But you, but you put ideas in children's mind because you trivialize, trivialize the Bible for children. Even children don't need the Bible made into a cartoon. Puts images in kids' minds. Pictures of a long-haired, effeminate Jesus. He wasn't. He wasn't. We need to be serious. We need to really become serious about producing disciples. And uh, we've tried to produce materials for that, for that end. One thing that young people need to do is learn how to study the Bible. Hey, the average adult in our churches doesn't know, don't, uh, doesn't know how to study the Bible. This might be an unusual church, and I think it is. Uh, but in my uh, experience preaching in 550 churches and hearing from people all the time by email, the average adult in an independent Baptist church is very biblically ignorant and really does not know how to study and interpret the Bible for himself. We've produced things to help us along that line. You can't know unless somebody teaches you how to study the Bible. My home church is going through this right now. How to study the Bible. How to use Bible study tools. How to use commentaries. How to use concordances. How to use uh, uh, treasure of scripture knowledge. How to interpret the Bible. How to avoid the pitfalls of false interpretations. And, and, and all of those powerful things. Young people need this. That's when they need it. Book of Proverbs. We're a powerful book families and churches and the new a new one we just published one year discipleship course this thing is is a, a discipleship course not just a bunch of pablum and truly a discipleship course how to know god's will how how to um make wise decisions 
and uh, how to be wise with your money. Deals with all sorts of things that young people face today, and adults. But producing disciples. Young people need to be taught to take God seriously in serving. To take Him seriously. God must be taken seriously. God will be taken seriously. One, uh, many people wrote to me about this. One said, we need to get them involved in the ministry. Fan the flame. Get saved young people involved in serving the Lord. Serving the Lord. One wrote and said, churches need to reduce the entertainment factor and focus on discipling the young people, which includes highlighting opportunities and teaching families and young people to serve. The base for this is teaching God's Word as the sole authority, but teaching them to, to serve the Lord. Every young person, if he's saved, and should have a ministry for the Lord. Everybody in the church should have a ministry. Each youth should have a ministry in the church. The Lord saved me in 1992. This was uh, one individual that wrote to me. And since then, I've been studying children and their results later in life. My conclusion are as follows. First, if you do not teach a child a ministry, when he turns 18 and you expect him to be an adult, you will be unpleasantly surprised. You will find that they cannot lead someone to Christ. They do not really have the application to go along with the head knowledge. It's there for trivia and it's there for a quick answer, but without application to life. The, re the children should be taught how to serve at the age of 11 to 13. Not because we want them to do the work that the rest of us don't want to do, but because we love them and we want them to learn and grow. Put them in a toddler class, being an assistant teacher. Put the boys in the building ministry, working with their hands. Get them involved in Bible clubs. Show them how to do it. The teens that are spiritually mature enough can be put in charge of some things. Putting someone in the ministry early in their youth teaches responsibility and consequences for actions. It gives them applied knowledge, which is wisdom. God has taught me much in this area, and I have practiced on my own kids and a few others in the church, and the outcome was amazing. In every case, they became strong members of the church. Send the young ladies and men 16 and up. But anyway, it's talking about service. Many, many things that young people can do to serve the Lord. Many, many things, depending on their spiritual condition, of course. Assistant teaching, taking up offerings, youth ushering, of course, visitation, evangelism, community Bible clubs, nursing home ministries, giving devotions at home, giving devotions in youth meetings. Hey, preaching. Uh, there's a missionary that I interviewed about this, song leading, discipling other youth, discipleship program where if a young person gets saved, another young person comes alongside that uh, has some spiritual maturity and, and, and goes through a little discipleship program with that other young person. Best way to grow is to teach. Setting up things for, for special meetings, helping the old and infirm, widows and orphans, building projects. Oh, there's an endless number of ways that young people can hands-on serve the Lord. In an interview with a missionary, he told me how that in his missionary church, uh, one of the ways that they prepare preachers, one of the biggest things we do on the mission field is prepare preachers. We look for God to get a hold of men, young men, and we just do everything we care to prepare them. And uh, that every church ought to be busy with that. And one thing he does is they have a 15-minute preaching session and uh, the young men that, that are, you know, that are uh, spiritually living for the Lord and called to preach are maybe showing some inclination that way, give a 15-minute sermon before the whole church. And then they have the regular sermons. Many things we can do to get the young people involved, not just sitting there watching. Children can serve the Lord even at very young ages. Teaching the children to take notes of sermons and discuss it afterwards instead of just goofing off and drawing pictures, playing. It's amazing what even little kids can get out of a sermon. 
if we expect them to. And they'll be children, and we shouldn't make church miserable for kids. They're kids. But they can still learn at their age level. If our expectations are just a little higher. And parents need to serve the Lord with their kids. That, this is so important. I love to see preachers that have their sons with them. Many times preachers will come to greet me or to go out to eat or whatever, and they have their son with them. And I, and I know right away that that is probably going to work out right. Kids need to be with adults, not with other stupid kids. More, as much as possible. I've got a friend that, I've got a friend that, uh, he has a young boy, um, early teens, I believe, and that boy is either with his dad, with other men in the church, or with older, really spiritual teens or young uh, spiritual men. That's where that young man is with. You know what's going to happen to that young man? We throw kids together, and the lowest common denominator of stupidity is what rules. I know I was a kid, and I went to public school, and that's what you got in public school. Lowest common denominator of stupidity. Ruling. Boy, that's smart. America's smart. You ever notice that? It's not just the TSA that's stupid. Everything's stupid because we rejected the Word of God. Children and young people need to be mentored by adults. One, wrote, one, one person wrote and said, Children always seem to be separated from the adults. They need to be included with them and mentored alongside of them. And then let me say finally that young people need to be taught to deal with issues they will face. We are in a raging battle tonight. A raging battle. When I was born in 1949, America was an entirely different nation than it is tonight. An entirely different nation. I never met an atheist when I was a kid. I never met a homosexual when I was a kid. I never met a Hindu or a Buddhist. They're everywhere now. They're in positions of power. Atheists are raging. Got their billboard campaigns and their full page ads in USA Today and whatnot. Raging out their atheism and their blasphemy against God and their hatred of, of, of Christ and the Bible. Big campaign right now by the Humanist Society. Full page ads in major newspapers across America. Raging against our faith. Raging pretending like their morality is superior to the Bible's morality and mocking the Bible and the things of Christ. Kids need to, they're going to have to confront that or they'll be destroyed by that. And hey, it's not difficult to confront it. The Bible is not difficult to defend. It is a historical faith, solid evidence. But, and young people need to be grounded in that and understand that and be prepared uh, uh, with that. I recently read about two Southern Baptist pastors that had lost their faith and they're agnostics. They're still working in Southern Baptist churches because they went to seminary and they don't have any other job skills. But they're interviewed with uh, uh, ABC World Tonight, Diane Sawyer, and uh, they're atheists. And they said, well, we were confronted with a new atheist like Richard Dawkins and we, didn't, couldn't, we couldn't answer them. Well, that's because you were not properly trained and also because you're probably not, well, you're not saved, but you weren't properly trained. It's not hard to answer Richard Dawkins, but you've got to be trained. Churches should find out what questions young people have. There's a good idea about taking a survey in the, in the community of, among young people and finding out what questions they have. And, and, and finding out one survey that was taken found that typical questions are like this. How do you know the Bible's true? 
Every young person in our church should be able to answer that with some solid evidence. It's why you know the Bible's true. Hasn't science disproved the Bible? Absolutely not. Uh, Charles Darwin wrote a book on the origin of species, and he didn't have one hint of evidence of how the species originated in that book. Not a hint. He had evidence of how about how um, a pigeon changes shape a little bit. But that's not the origin of species. How did the pigeon become a pigeon? That's what I want to know. He doesn't have a clue as far as evidence. And, and they never have since then come up with any evidence. But young people need to be taught these things. Isn't the world millions of years old? What about carbon dating? How did Noah get all the animals on the ark? Uh, um, how come there's so many different races of people? How did the dinosaurs fit on the ark? What's the evidence for the global flood? How can you believe in a loving God when there's so much death and suffering in the world? Didn't the writers of the Bible make mistakes? How do we know the Bible's translated correctly? Doesn't the Bible contain contradictions? How can God... And, and so these kinds of questions, are they're there, man. These questions are there today in our society. You can't hide today unless you go up some cave somewhere and unplug, totally unplug from the Internet. That's not what God wants us to do. We, 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 need, we can confront these things. We can help people. We can be light in a dark world. Our young people can be arrows in the hands of a mighty man. We need to teach them to deal with realistic confrontations rather than just straw men. And uh, so discipleship. Well, there's a lot more there we could talk about. But having the mindset that we want to produce we, we want to produce disciples, not just good kids that don't get into a lot of trouble. No, disciples for Christ. Disciples for Christ. That, there's nothing more exciting in the universe than being a disciple for Christ. Christ, the living, eternal God. And I can be saved and be flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone and take a stand for him in this wicked world and live for him forever in all of his glory. Well, there's nothing more exciting than that. That's solid reality that'll last forever. Disciples for Christ. If we don't begin to take these things seriously, there's no way to win this battle. Maybe churches could skate along 100 years ago, 75 years ago, but you're not going to skate today. It's like going up a river, a, a powerful river, and if you're not paddling hard up, well, you're going to be going back. The force that is against us is very strong tonight. But we have victory. There's no need at all for discouragement. Not a hint. We have victory and the hour is very late. But until Christ comes, we are to occupy. And in the sense of going out into the enemy's territory. And it's not that difficult to answer the lies of the devil. I thank God for this book tonight and Jesus Christ. Pastor, would you come? Way of Life Literature produces materials designed to confront the issues of today from a Bible-believing perspective, as well as solid Bible study material for the church, home, and individual believer. Most of our books, videos, and slide presentations are available in hard copy and print editions, as well as electronic downloads. See our website for the latest offerings or to view our entire catalog. While there, subscribe to our free email news service, the Fundamental Baptist Information Service. It's available at wayoflife.org.